the great 19th century Russian writer and Orthodox Christian, Fyodor Dostoevsky, said that beauty will save the world. The beauty that he was speaking of and the beauty that we hope to encounter through this presentation is not the uh, merely aesthetic beauty. There is a certain aesthetic beauty that we'll see in iconography, but a beauty that's deeper. So we'll begin uh, with the earliest images that we have of Christ, some of which go back all the way to the first two centuries. A church full of iconography is not something that is uniquely Christian. In fact, we know from certain synagogues that were preserved, some of the earliest images that we have of Christ were Christ as the Good Shepherd. And implicit in this image is certain echoes of the Old Testament as well as the New. Ezekiel prophesied that one would come who would shepherd the people, that he would give them a new heart, that he would feed them. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, we hear of the judgment, where it says that when the Lord comes again, he will come as a king and a shepherd. He will divide the people, those on his left as the goats and those on his right as sheep. The majority of the early, early iconography that we have was preserved in catacombs. Uh, we have some that were preserved in house churches or the remains, as we have in the case of Dura Europus. But uh, it's really the catacombs in Rome where some of the most beautiful images were found. Another image of Christ as the Good Shepherd. One of the things that you will notice as we go through these images is not only as we get later from the time of Christianity's founding of Christ's death and resurrection, uh, do the icons get a little bit more detailed, there's more symbolism added to it, but you'll notice that Christ ages. The other very interesting point is that at this time you had many philosophical schools throughout the Hellenistic world, the Roman Empire, uh, and these philosophical schools by the time of Christ had become not so much what we think of as philosophy, but they had really become very religious. Here we have from Dura Europus, we have a gospel image of the woman touching the hem of Christ's garment. Another common image that we have uh, in the early church, and this is just one that was recently discovered, I believe in the 19th century. All the, a lot of these images come from the book of Revelation, John's Apocalypse, which interestingly is the one book that's never read within the church liturgically. Here we, we begin to see some more of this, this detail. And, and very early on, writing became inextricably bound up with the, the image itself. Right? In fact, to this day, it's not considered an icon unless it's been titled. Here we have an image, late 3rd, early 4th century, and we have the earliest image of Christ depicted with a beard. We still have the Alpha and the Omega. And in many ways, this becomes almost the prototype image for all the following centuries of the depictions of Christ. Here we have one of the, the images of Christ with that clean-shaven, younger, more youthful look. Here we have uh, one of the, the beautiful mosaics, early mosaics of in Mount Sinai. A number of these early images of Christ that I'll be showing you come from this one specific monastery in Sinai. Here we have uh, an early Coptic, an early Egyptian icon of Christ. And there are certain features that will continue. And when we, a little bit later, we'll see some more contemporary Coptic icons, uh, the smaller size, the larger eyes, another early Coptic icon of Christ. I believe that's at the Prothesis table, the place where they would prepare bread and wine that would be offered. In the liturgy. Here we have one of the most famous icons of Christ. This is a, a 6th century or 5th century icon. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as the, the Pantocrator of Sinai. It was actually painted using colored wax. 
they would melt the beeswax and they would add the dyes to it, mix it up. It's one of the most difficult ways to paint because if you think about it, every stroke has to just about be perfect. If you take that same image and you make it symmetrical, so you just mirror each side, this is the image that you get. When these two sides are brought in, we have this beautiful of a Christ that is both merciful but also judge. Here we have one of the most fascinating icons that we found at Sinai. This is an icon that, if you're familiar with iconographic traditions, would see this and you'd say, ah, it's an icon of the Ancient of Days. Right? It shows Christ enthroned with the white beard, with the white hair. And yet, the iconographer does something kind of sneaky. He titles this icon Emmanuel, one of the most famous mosaics. This, of course, is the mosaic of Christ and Hagia Sophia. Uh, from a distance, and most mosaics are, they were actually designed to be seen at a specific distance. The, the, the ge level of geometry that these people were capable of, to know that just when, what size of tile to use from the distance that the image would be depicted. So you really wouldn't be able to see it as a mosaic. Here we have uh, an early Frankish icon, right? Christ is much lighter, right? He, he looks like he could be a Frankish king. Here we have a icon. This is a, an interesting icon. This is an icon at... Uh, the monastery of Osios Lucas in Greece uh, from, I believe it's the 10th or 11th century. If you reflect back on those early images where he has a fuller, clean-shaven face, and now, you know, he has this, this very stern image on his face. This is going to be a little bit difficult to see, but again, that idea of kind of incarnational. Uh, we have an ancient Chinese icon of Christ here. Uh, painted on silk. A lot of people don't realize this, but the early Assyrian church sent missionaries to China uh, and parts of the population converted. This is one of my favorite icons of Christ. This is uh, an icon at Osha. This entire church is a cave carved out of soft limestone and painted. And it's a very distinct iconographic tradition. Uh, it's very ancient, 10th, 11th century, or when these icons are painted. At the end of the Byzantine Empire, the East Roman Empire, we enter into what's called the Paleologan Renaissance. And this is really at a time when the empire is really nothing more than Constantinople, Thessaloniki, the southern part of the Peloponnesus, uh, the the shore of the Black Sea. Everything else has been taken away. Taken by the West, taken by the East, and, and little remains. And yet this, this period, this time period, that give us people like St. Gregory Palamas, St. Nicholas Cavasilas, uh, is really the height of the Christian Hellenic uh, creation. Here's another icon at the Protaton of Emmanuel Pancelinos, and uh, it's not as well preserved but you'll notice his beard shorter, his hair shorter. And this is actually uh, the image of Christ as he sits at the table. Yes. Right? If you remember from the story of Christ after he rose from the dead, he's with Luke and Cleopa. He breaks bread. They don't recognize him at first because he has another form. Right? So here, the, saint, the iconographer adjusted the image. Again, still identifiably Christ, but also identifiably different. It becomes more and more common, uh, especially on uh, icons that are iconostas, where you'll see the silver, sometimes gold. Uh, this one, his body is actually exposed in a lot of those icons, and I'm sure you've all seen them, uh, where it's just the faces painted and the rest is the gold or silver. It's called the... the uh, and originally its purpose was to protect the icon, right? The older the icon gets, the more people kiss it, uh, it would begin to wear away. So they'd put this 
around it to protect it. This is another uh, example of that Paleologan Renaissance. We have here the icon of Christ uh, at the Church of the Chora. It's a, a small church that uh, survives now as a monastery uh, in Constantinople. It was referred to as Chora because at the time that it was built, it was kind of in the, the countryside. This icon is titled Chora uh, ton Zondon, the land of the living. As time goes by, there's more and more features that become almost universal. Uh, so for example, uh, he will nearly always be depicted with the red undergarment, the blue outer garment. You'll see the, the gold stripe on his side uh, to the point where, again, it almost becomes uniform that his hair will always be swept to his left shoulder and you'll actually have the, the two curls below. Here we have, uh, you'll notice a, a rather different style from what we've seen. This is a, a famous Russian icon by Andrei Rublev. Andrei Rublev, of course, is a, a saint of the church. He's most famous for his icon of that depicts the three angels, uh, what in Greek is usually titled the Philoxenia of Abraham that we have above our altar. Here we begin to see uh, some, some Western influence. Right? Some of the, the artistic achievements that took place in the Renaissance are beginning to uh, be adopted by the Orthodox East. This is a, an early Russian icon, right? You know, almost, almost uh, could picture that on like a Viking flag, right? This is after kind of that Western influence was adopted. So apart from the name, the last color that you put on is the white. And that, in an icon, gives a depth to it. It kind of brings the image into the space that we're in. Right? It's not a two-dimensional, there's a separation, but uh, it brings it out, as well as within the icon itself, there's this movement from darkness to light. So these next few images are images of the icon that's traditionally referred to as Emmanuel that shows Christ depicted as a, a young child, the icon of mid-Pentecost. Uh, this is the, the icon where we learn of how Christ, when he was 12, he was with the, the priests and the scribes at the temple. Uh, this, is, this is Greco, the famous painter. He was Greek. Uh, he lived the later part of his life in Spain. And we, we see someone who interestingly has a foot in both worlds. A foot in the, the Renaissance as well as a foot in his Orthodox heritage. Certain simplicity to the Coptic icons. Uh, one of the things you'll notice, there's always kind of almost as if they're drawn in the dark, that dark outline, very pronounced border. We have a, a contemporary uh, icon by Photius Conteglou. Uh, Photius Conteglou was, uh, uh, lived in the early part of the 20th century, and he kind of went back. At this time, even in Greece, there was this real... Uh, people were enamored with what was more Western. Uh, and so you'd have the, the, the blonde Jesus with the flowing locks and the blue eyes. Here we have an iconographer in Greece who has, uh, again, this idea of incarnation. He's kind of incarnated the traditional iconography into a traditional Greek folk art. Notice Christ is not holding the gospel book. He's holding a, a vine with the, the grapes, right? And so a number, a lot of his icons depict Christ holding different uh, images from parables that he taught. This is a, another contemporary iconographer uh, who actually, before becoming an iconographer, was a graffiti artist and a relatively famous graffiti artist in Athens. Some people would see this icon, and I know some of them, and they wouldn't be able to kiss it because it's, it's, it, it's discordant with their view of Christ as he's presented in icons. Very powerful image of Christ. Taking this idea of Christ incarnate, right? this is an icon in response to the 20th century, the Holocaust of the Jews, the Gulag of the Soviet Union. It's called the Christ Rumeli, Bolioeti. And uh, again, it's taking that that idea of incarnation. This is an icon of Christ at Sopochani, 
which is a, a monastery in Serbia. The incarnation is the justification for the icon, and the icon displays the incarnation. If human art is able to portray a transfigured world, it is because matter itself, which the painter uses, has been secretly sanctified by the incarnation.